So uh, I know you talk mainly about research in, in your talk, but there's also what we have now, which is borderless education, right? There are a lot of online courses. I know MIT has an open course where, where students can access a variety of different courses. Other universities also have similar programs. So how do you think that's going to affect traditional undergraduate education, both in the US and elsewhere? And elsewhere? OK. So there are, I, I didn't go into details of this, but I, um, th th let me say a few things of this. First and foremost, uh, anything we can do with technology that enhances learning uh, will, be, will be wonderful. So if we can use technology to enhance learning and disseminate it, that, that's, that's great. But even before MOOCs, as you know, uh, MIT and others have had things like open courseware for more than 10 years. Um, the question becomes, is making content available uh, either in real time or asynchronously sufficient for learning outcomes? So one of the reasons I didn't go into this is because there is a lot of research that's going on. For example, uh, the National Science Foundation supports something called the Science of Learning Centers. So what are the best pedagogical outcomes? Uh, so the jury is still out on whether this is the best way to disseminate information. The second thing is goes back to some of the themes that I repeated with respect to open access. Unless you have a viable financial model, it's unlikely to succeed for the long haul. So take private American university, any university in the US, Carnegie Mellon included, the tuition is very, very high. So if you're charging $45,000 a year to a local student to come to campus, while you're giving the same content away for free for anybody else, it will not go down very well. And that's not a viable financial model. So how do you create a viable financial model so that uh, ultimately you use the technology to benefit education on a global scale, but it's workable financially? The third argument is that um, many people would argue that looking at painting uh, of the Sistine Chapel on your computer is not the same as being inside the Sistine Chapel and looking at the painting. Uh, same way, uh, taking IIT courses, IIT Madras courses from a laptop at your home may not be the same as living in a hostel here for four years and uh, absorbing this experience and then cherishing it for the rest of your life. So there is a value to on-campus experience. There is a value you learn. There is an added value, financial value, to being in a university campus. The question is, does it have to be four years? And you have two years online and two years on campus where you can reduce the cost. Again, you need a financial model to, to, to address that. So this is a topic of a lot of active discussion, including at CMU. Uh, CMU has not officially been intentionally part of any of the MOOCs, but there are a lot of activities going on on campus, discussions on what can be done in a financially viable way so that you can make it work. You can use the technology to educate larger number of numbers of people than what you have on campus, but at the same time, you can improve the on-campus experience using technology. For example, it can completely change the way you give lectures in class rather than standing in front of the board and writing on with a piece of chalk. Uh, you can you can have a completely different mode of delivery. And, and, and this is part and parcel of the transformation that's going to take place over the next few, uh, few years or so with the right financial model. You mentioned CMU has a campus in Qatar, very few people. So what attracted CMU in Qatar? So th th there, are, there are, you know, this is nine years old, so I was not part of the discussion. but. The, 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 the compelling reasons were that uh, you, know, you have access to um, a, a global presence with a viable model where you can take some of your strengths. And it's not the only university. There is also Cornell, Texas A&M, uh, Northwestern, Georgetown. And all are located in roughly the same, same part of the uh, uh, same campus. So it's not just one American university, it's an, a cluster of American universities participating in a new education model. This is no different from what was done in Singapore, where there are a number of institutions 
Um, I was part of creating an MIT research center in, in Singapore called the Smart Center. You have ETH Zurich, you have Technion and Weizmann from Israel, UC Berkeley and a number of other institutions. So there, there, there are different countries that do this in very different ways. Of course, there is a lot of local flavor to this and local circumstances. And um, the idea is you, you also give your faculty and students a very different cultural exposure, especially in a region of the world where perhaps better cultural exposure is, would be beneficial for both sides. Um, and of course, it has to be a financially viable model for the reasons I mentioned about the MOOCs. So all of this has to, has to play into this. And there are, I don't remember the exact numbers, but something like two, 250 or so students graduate every year in a few select areas uh, in the Qatar campus. Yes, Thanks for the wonderful talk, Russell. I'm curious about this global research council that you talked about. There are examples like the NSF and the Binational Science Foundation in Israel funding joint programs that bring researchers <laughs> together in those countries. But those are relatively small scale kinds of programs. Are there opportunities through these types of discussions with such a large number of countries to create PRC or, or center scale activities that would perhaps even bring in companies yeah. and, and, and have opportunities for transformative research that would have global impact? Uh, absolutely. In fact, that, that's the ultimate goal. So things like, for example, if you want to study climate change, um, you can still fund people in your own country because most funding agencies have requirements from their governments that you cannot send money abroad. But that hasn't stopped us in the past from uh, working together. Let me give the example of uh, astronomy. 70% um, of all the ground-based, land-based astronomy observations are made from the country of Chile because in the Atacama Desert of Chile at an altitude of about almost 6,000 meters, that's the, one of the best locations to put telescopes. And the National Science, US National Science Foundation has put in more than a billion dollars into Chile for astronomy. So this has been done and uh, in the past, but what this does through Global Research Council is to formalize this process so that Every time you, you try to come up with an agreement between a few countries or a few funding agencies, you run into the problem. How do we do peer review? How do we do assessment? What do we do with the data? Do we have special access and privileges? So by what the Global Research Council is trying to do is to create principles that are collectively developed and endorsed already. Peer review, research integrity, open access, uh, open access to publications, open access to data, etc. Once you have that in place, next time an opportunity arises, you, have, you don't have to start from scratch. You can say, here are all the principles, and that's the goal. Um, uh, and, and I think uh, there, there are tremendous opportunities to do that. And one of the areas is both in education with respect to things like MOOCs, uh, and also with respect to access to information and knowledge. If these funding agencies can agree on a path forward, in Berlin two months ago I was at the meeting, uh, they released uh, an action plan over the next uh, two, three years that all these funding agencies of the world will come together and, uh, and help. There is also a societal element to this. One of the discussions that took place in Berlin was uh, some of the Af sub-Saharan African countries said, we don't have the resources. You know, we cannot put money in so that we can match what the US or, or UK can do today because we're in a different stage of development. It turns out it doesn't matter. If the top 10 funding agencies in the world can put the money in, it doesn't matter what the rest of them put in or not, you can still make significant progress. That kind of a realization will not happen until people get together at, around a table. And this is the first time those 47 agency heads are, have ever met together. And uh, so the fact that they are meeting and the fact that countries are fighting over to host these meetings is a very good indication for the future. So if we can sustain that, I think it will have a potentially significant impact. Quite a lot. Uh, in fact, you know, China has a, 
uh, articulated policy of they want a um, uh, certain number of top universities in the world by 2020. And so the economic policy is to give a significant increase in the science budget. So the circle that I showed you for China, not only is the circle moving up to the top right, uh, the circle is getting bigger and bigger. It's growing at a much faster rate than many other countries. And that will have a huge impact 10, 20 years down the road. The benefit that the US reaped um, was because of a lot of the economic and political policies of not only the US, but also other countries. When uh, Second World War and Hitler's uh, uh, philosophies led to the migration of people from Europe to the US, the number of Nobel laureates in the US significantly migration policies, which are political factors, sometimes economic factors, have a huge role in innovation ecosystem. Um, the investments in science and engineering, so take the uh, John Kennedy's, uh, President Kennedy's uh, 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 goal of landing man on the moon before the end of the 1960s. That had a huge impact on how many people in the US took science and engineering as an undergraduate major. So that galvanized an entire generation. Uh, he was also a very powerful articulate speaker. And uh, so economic policies can have a huge impact. Uh, I watched uh, Singapore. I've been part of a lot of government discussions in Singapore over the last 20 years. And Singapore has transformed its education system in the last 20 years. Of course, their goal is because they, they have very limited population. Uh, one of their goals is to attract talent from all over the world, especially from Asia. And the economic investments into education have had a huge impact on their education act activities. And it's not an accident that Singapore, in all the standardized high school and elementary school tests, is ranked number one or number two in mathematics, science, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so there are a lot of factors that link economics uh, with, uh, you know, with, with education and education. Science somewhere it's good for science everything. How is it possible to create good science everywhere possible by by this network is what you talked about? I especially, you know, my question is about how is it possible to make people do good science in places where science is almost impossible because of war, because of uh, terror? Because natural calamity. How do we bring people who are lost for science? Okay. So, you know, one of the really good things about the scientific community is that even if you look back 30 years ago during the time of Cold War, when governments were not talking to one another, scientists were talking to one another. How many scientists in Sweden and the US posted Russian scientists who immigrated? Uh, so scientists were always collaborated. Uh, in fact, in one of the uh, things about um, uh, uh, agencies like the National Science Foundation, we talk about science for diplomacy and diplomacy for science. In fact, oftentimes when political discussions don't work, scientific discussions work, the meeting, the Global Research Council meeting, um, if a political entity like the foreign ministry, for example, were to organize this, it would be a lot more complicated than the science agency organizing it. Uh, in fact, people were surprised uh, in many foreign ministries that we invited 48 countries to come at their own expense, and 47 came. One country could not come, it was South Africa, because they, they didn't come, not because they didn't want to come because there was a change of leadership. Logistically, it just did not work out for them at that time. And uh, uh, they participated in the next meeting. So I think science often plays a unique role uh, in diplomacy where politics cannot play. And I had a very good feel of that in my previous job, where dealing with embassies and ambassadors, when oftentimes political discussions fail, scientific discussions are very easy to foster. Um, 
so so I think uh, it it uh, uh, th that's one of the reasons. So how do you make sure good science thrives everywhere? That's exactly where where we we want to make sure that if I w I take the personal view that if somebody invests in science, it doesn't matter where it is, if that money is wasted or is perceived as being wasted, it's not good for science anywhere because the next rich person or the rich government will not make that investment because they will see that as a failed investment. So how do you create this? Uh, so it, it's, it's not just the investment in science that makes a country an innovation leader, but you have to have the right infrastructure. I don't mean the building, gleaming new buildings. I mean the processes, processes that are open, transparent, and and you you keep politics out of. You want to make sure that uh, scientific publications are not blocked in a particular country because that doesn't suit the political convenience of the leadership of that country, or when uh, uh, when uh, you have um, uh, uh, a particular view. Um, being propagated that's not scientifically sound. So a good way to, science always works when somebody comes up with the idea, all the other scientists try to reproduce it. If they cannot, they're going to shoot it down. Uh, and uh, so that reproducibility, that validation, that peer review, free of political influence is often critical. That means if somebody is establishing a new funding agency, you want to make sure that they have all the processes. So in the last 10 years, Many countries have established new funding agencies modeled after the National Science Foundation. Ireland, China, um, Vietnam, and uh, many other countries. So I think it's, it's important, uh, and you can play a major role. So one of the things we used to do was to invite people from anywhere in the world to come and see how our processes work. We, they can sit as observers in review panels. Of course, they have to sign a confidentiality agreement. Um, and uh, you show them how you handle software. Um, and, and you can do that in a transparent way. The other reason to do that is now more than half of the publications coming from the US today, I forget the exact number, somewhere between 40 and 50% have a co-author from a country other than the US. So you want to make sure that standards are met, research integrity, etc. Work. Otherwise, even prestigious journals are not going to succeed if they want to ensure proper integrity of publications. So I think this is a borderless world. And given that highly global nature of it, it's everybody's duty to make sure that you have uh, a good scientific enterprise. Maybe, uh, maybe Dr. Kumar has It's only one step away uh, from the arts, philosophy. Like, philosophy and art, philosophy in particular has not been receiving the kind of uh, attention it received in the previous century. Maybe national and the arts, but it somehow doesn't gel. Sciences just taking on the behavioral sciences to pull it all off. So. Uh, 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 I explicitly did not mention it. In fact, uh, it's in my formal speech tomorrow uh, about, about the arts and humanities as well. I think, uh, in fact, this is one of the significant strengths of Carnegie Mellon, uh, bringing arts and technology together in a, in a very significant way. Um, in fact, uh, in, in, the, in the Antarctica program, uh, we, we have a funding mechanism from the National Science Foundation for a program called Artists in Residence, because the colors that you see for uh, sunrise or sunset uh, in Antarctica, of course, the sun doesn't set for four months uh, in, in the southern summers or northern winters. Uh, and, and in the wintertime, you don't see the sun for four or five months. And, and Artists in Residence program is a very popular program. They oftentimes, artists see Antarctica very differently than scientists see Antarctica. And, and it's very important to get that very different perspective. Uh, so I, uh, you know, when, in fact, I, I didn't explicitly say it, but, but I agree with the sentiment that, uh, uh, you know, if, if 
one can go a little bit further um, uh, when you have a diversity of perspectives, whether the diversity comes from uh, gender diversity or ethnic diversity or geographical diversity or economic diversity uh, or intellectual diversity, whether you come look at it as an artist or as a scientist or as an engineer, um, uh, I think you, you are able to contribute differently to the problem than if you have a monolithic group of a team of people who all come from the same discipline. So I think, uh, you know, this is what enriches, in fact, uh, one of the reasons Apple has been so successful as a company is because they paid attention to the artistic side of technology more so than any other company. And, uh, and, and, and you know, that's a tangible example of art and technology merging together. And uh, uh, so I, I agree with, with that. Now, I think it's got to do something to the uh, highly uh, fine tuned sense of political correctness. I think nobody is doing serious science or serious social science, only wants to mess around. Philosophy is just not. There are philosophers in all universities, I know that. They are not. Well, there, there is another reason to, you know, philosophy, arts, or humanities, and so forth. There is another reason to do this as well. So, you take. Uh, undergraduate freshmen at MIT, 65% of the incoming freshmen on average in the last decade or so, 65% are more than average in one type of music or another. And while they are undergraduate students, you want to make sure that they are given adequate opportunity to practice music. So right next to my office were two rooms with grand pianos, all times of the evening and weekends. <coughs> There's wonderful music coming out of this every time I walk by. And, and I think you know, this, is, uh, this is so important. I and mean, you look at mathematics and music as two fields that come together. I mean, philosophy, of course, you can, you know, you can link to being an intellectual and, and thinking uh, you know, ab abstract thoughts and so forth. But music and, and uh, science, music and engineering. And I would even take that further. Um, learning languages, uh, you know, that, that's, it, it used to be a requirement in the US that if you want to get a PhD, you minor in a language other than English. And I took French as a minor for both. And given that highly global nature of it, it's everybody's duty to make sure that you have uh, a good scientific enterprise. Uh, Professor, you mentioned that But it's only one step away, uh, you know, the arts, the philosophy, in fact. Philosophy and art, philosophy in particular has not been receiving the kind of uh, attention it received in the previous century, maybe national And the arts, but it doesn't gel. Sciences, just taking on the behavioral sciences to pull it all off. So, uh, 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 I explicitly did not mention it. In fact, uh, it's in my formal speech tomorrow uh, about, about the arts and humanities as well. I think, uh, in fact, this is one of the significant strengths of Carnegie Mellon, uh, bringing arts and technology together in a, in a very significant way. Um, in fact, uh, in, in, the, in the Antarctica program, uh, we, we have a funding mechanism from the National Science Foundation for a program called Artists in Residence, because the colors that you see for uh, sunrise or sunset uh, in Antarctica, of course, the sun doesn't set for four months uh, in, in the southern summers or northern winters. Uh, and, and in the wintertime, you don't see the sun for four or five months. And, and Artists in Residence program is a very popular program. They oftentimes, artists see Antarctica very differently than scientists see Antarctica. And, and it's very important to get that very different perspective. Uh, so I, uh, you know, when, in fact, I, I didn't explicitly say it, but, but I agree with the sentiment that, uh, uh, you know, if, if one can go a little bit further, um, 
when you have a diversity of perspectives, whether the diversity comes from uh, gender diversity or ethnic diversity or geographical diversity or economic diversity uh, or intellectual diversity, whether you come look at it as an artist or as a scientist or as an engineer, um, uh, I think you, you are able to contribute differently to the problem than if you have a monolithic group of a team of people who all come from the same discipline. So I think, uh, you know, this is what enriches. In fact, uh, one of the reasons Apple has been so successful as a company is because they paid attention to the artistic side of technology more so than any other company. And, uh, and, and, and you know, that's a tangible example of art and technology merging together. And uh, uh, so I, I agree with, with that. Horizon these days, say like Russell, mixed maths and philosophy. Philosophy is now, I think it's got to do something to do with the highly, I find you sense of political correctness. I think nobody is doing serious science or serious social science, everyone wants to mess around. Philosophy is just not, there are philosophers in all universities, I know that. They are not, they are not. Well, there is another reason to, you know, philosophy arts or humanities and so forth, there's another reason to do this as well. So you take uh, uh, undergraduate freshmen at MIT, 65% of the incoming freshmen on average in the last decade or so, 65% are more than average in one type of music or another. And while they are undergraduate students, you want to make sure that they are given adequate opportunity to practice music. So right next to my office were two rooms with grand pianos, all times of the evening and weekends. And there's wonderful music coming out of this every time I walk by. And, and I think you know, this, is, uh, this is so important. I and mean, you look at mathematics and music as two fields that come together. I mean, philosophy, of course, you can, you know, you can link to being an intellectual and, and thinking uh, you know, ab abstract thoughts and so forth. But music and, and uh, science, music and engineering, and I would even take that further, um, uh, learning languages. Uh, you know, that, that's, it, it used to be a requirement in the US that if you want to get a PhD, you minor in a language other than English. And I took French as a minor for my PhD at MIT uh, because it, it, you know, it was a fun thing to do. And, and, uh, but, but it's no longer a requirement. And universities have changed that requirement. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, the, the, a lot of that has to do with economics, but, uh, but this is one of the reasons why the liberal arts education has been very successful in the U.S. Uh, for many years, because this is the goal of, this is how the Ivy League school started, as, a, as, as an educated individual, as a well-rounded individual, who has an appreciation for a much broader portfolio of things, rather than just a, a narrow subject. And I remember taking German at IAT. I don't know if you still have this or not. So. Yeah, one more question. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, you told about uh, research and funding in the US. Uh, what, according to you, should be done in India to encourage R&D? <laughs> more funding, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so given the fact that India's GDP growth rate is more than that of the US. Um, that's right, but if you, you saw my graph, right? So you saw where India was as of last year, at least according to the Bethel data, there's still a lot of room to grow, even if it's, uh, so I think you need to go to the top right corner of the graph. I think there is a tangible goal. Uh, so, you know, Finland and Israel uh, and South Korea uh, have an investment in R&D that's for more than 4% of the GDP. India is about 1%. So there is a significant room. As the GDP grows, R&D has to grow faster too to catch up. So I think that's what China is doing right now. So there is a, there's a lot of room to grow. The other part is, uh, you know, not only the horizontal part, but the vertical part too. So do you have, given the large size of the country as a fraction of the population, uh, do you have uh, adequate scientists and engineers who are trained, who are available, uh, and uh, to, to contribute to the science? The, the scientific enterprise, and uh, how do you create that, uh, that ecosystem? Also, the, the whole infrastructure of uh, 
it's one thing to create a funding agency and give it money. It's another thing to also have the infrastructure to, uh, uh, to make sure that all the processes, the software, the, the, the tools to handle large numbers of proposals are in place. And these are some of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Ramasamy and I talked about. And I know there is a new organization in India uh, that, that does this. Can I have a question, please? Yeah, please. Your talk you emphasized uh, the need for uh, basic science and investment and basic science and so on. Uh, I, I believe what we need today uh, is more social science. Uh, everywhere in the world, there is terrorism, there is uh, violence, there are all kinds of human problems. People are unable to uh, cope with them. At the moment, what we need more than basic sciences is social science research. What um, do you think about it? So, I agree that uh, we need social sciences. That, that's the point I made in my talk. But I'm not going to speculate whether we need more social sciences than natural sciences. or I mean, That's a highly subjective argument. My, I think all of social sciences without basic science and era of technology or all of natural sciences without social science will be a mistake. So you need the balance. What is the adequate balance? We don't know. Um, for example, historically, fields of social sciences, behavioral sciences, economic sciences, and so forth, were not as expensive because you didn't have a lot of big facilities like telescopes or DNA sequencing machines and so, and so forth. But now, they are also getting expensive because you need supercomputers to mine big so, social data and things like this. So, so um, I think, so at NSF, for example, out of a $7, $7 billion budget, the budget for social, behavioral, and economic sciences was a little more than $300 million a year because there was, there was not uh, uh, big facilities that were funded out of it. But now there is a need for bigger facilities. So it has, to, it has to grow over time. But I agree with your sentiment that you need a balance of these two if you were to address. And I think uh, uh, the, the biggest example I will give uh, for, as to why you need the social sciences Terrorism, human behavior is one part of it. There is another reason. So the first NSF-funded center was a, was a weather prediction center in Oklahoma. And uh, the, they've done a beautiful job over 25 years, purely in engineering and, and computational modeling. What they have not done adequately so far is uh, how do people respond to warnings? So if you have a mobile device, what is the best way to send a warning about a weather event so that people will actually read it and follow it and respond to it? So human behavior comes in. And different regions of the country and different regions of the world have different human behavior patterns which are culturally influenced locally. And I think that kind of a merging of, of fields is, is necessary. Okay. Let us thank